Um, in today, I want to talk a little bit about why emetophobia sufferers tend to have, or for, for the vast majority, it's definitely something that comes up a lot when I'm speaking to them, OCD at the same okay. time, or just obsessional thinking in general. So why do you think that those two tend to go hand in hand so much, emetophobia and obsessive compulsive disorder? Okay. This is the point where I normally say, wow, what a great question, Joe. That's really quite a big question. And they yeah, always yeah, are. Yeah. Um, okay, so two, two things. First of all, you've got you to think for our purposes and for, you, for, our, for our viewers, listeners' benefit. So when we talk about obsessive thinking, we're not talking about necessarily full-blown OCD, not full-blown obsessive compulsive disorder, right? If obsessive compulsive disorder is... 10 out of 10 on the obsessional scale okay obsessional thinking let's say is five to nine okay five to nine on that scale right so every emetophobe that we've ever worked with has got a significant amount of obsessive thinking okay sometimes called brooding and ruminating right they brood and ruminate and overthink things right they're obsessive in their thinking some of them are unfortunate enough that that's gone to the nth degree, that's gone to 9 or 10 out of 10, where they, were, they would have a diagnosis of full-blown obsessive-compulsive disorder, which is only really, a, I say only really a, a, an advanced version of obsessive thinking. Okay? Obsessive thinking then characterised by picking at thoughts ideas, um, pictures, images in your mind. Getting an idea in your mind and going over and over and over that same thing. Brooding about it, worrying about it, thinking about it, Googling it, talking to others about it. Just having it on your mind the whole time. Um, what happens is, so obsess obsessive thinking, as well as black and white thinking, as well as catastrophizing as well as hypervigilance are all symptoms of a strong desire for control okay and if you if you remember a, a strong desire for control in itself is a symptom of a person that hasn't developed particularly good coping skills not necessarily in every area of their life but at least in one area of their life right if you feel you can't cope with something, or if you feel you couldn't cope with something, you, you, you've got to keep away, okay? You've got to you know, not go there, all right? And one of the ways of being confident in your ability to not go there is being hypervigilant, is um, having black and white thinking, is uh, to an extent being a perfectionist, but all of that uh, and overthinking something. So you tell me we're going to this party on Friday night, Okay, I'd, I'd like to go, but now I'm going to think about who's going, what age group are going, is going to be lots of drinking, is going to be eating, what sort of food am I expected to bring something? So I'm, I, I'm overthinking everything about this party with the intention of deciding whether I feel confident enough to go or not or whether I have to just totally avoid it because I, I can't get my head around the risk and the possible exposure to someone being ill or me being ill, so I'm not going to go. So brooding then, obsessing, is a symptom of this desire for control. I need to over-control this situation. Okay, If someone believes that they won't be able to cope or, or they, they, won't be, they, they won't allow themselves to feel vulnerable or tolerate feeling scared or anxious, okay, they have to avoid. They, 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 you know, if, they, if they feel it's like a fate worse than death, which as we know emetophobes do, I have to avoid that. Okay? And then that desire to control that situation, I can't control my emotions, so I have to control the situation. I've got to control the environment. If I can't control my emotions, I have to control the environment because it's too scary otherwise. And one of the ways you do that is by brooding and overthinking about something and looking at it from a thousand different angles. Remember that we've also said several times that your average emetophobe uh, is, is more than averagely bright. 
okay that, that that you have to be clever you have to be bright to be obsessive to have that kind of brain that can cope with that amount of information that processing power so so emetophobes are almost always in fact i've never known them not to be higher than normal level of um probably a higher a higher iq than most but certainly um brighter quicker in their thinking than the average person would be and the obsessive part of it is going over and over and over something in their mind because it's frightening because it's frightening because it's scary i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna overthink this thing now right i just want to be absolutely mm. certain that if we do this thing i'm gonna feel safe so I'm going to brood and ruminate and I'm going to over overthink on it. And and the the negative aspect of that, because your next question to me is going to be, why are all emetophobes obsessive? <laughs> they they wouldn't have emetophobia if they weren't obsessive. I would say that it's impossible mm. to have emetophobia without being obsessive. Okay? Because you have to brood and brood and brood about it to make it as big as it is okay your average yeah. person with a phobia of flying for example isn't terrified every day your average person with a fear of flying only worries about it for the two or three weeks before they're going to fly and there's not that many people that totally avoid flying a lot of people that got a fear of flying would still fly they'd endure that anxiety okay but it, but but you know it's very very rare i don't think i ever remember someone who was that pathologically frightened of flying that they were like housebound because of it yeah or any other phobia something more common like a phobia of dogs i don't recall a person that was so phobic of dogs that they t they didn't even leave the house they were that scared and the reason why it doesn't get that big for phobia dogs is because you don't have to be obsessive to have a phobia of dogs so you're not thinking about it all day every day if you were thinking about your phobia of dogs all day every day you wouldn't leave the house yep. you make yep. it much bigger by the fact it's bad enough it's horrible enough the fact that if i think about a dog i feel anxious and scared right if i think about a dog or that time i was bitten by a dog I feel anxious and scared okay now if i think about that 10 times a day i'm going to feel anxious and scared 10 times a day out the blue i haven't seen a dog i've been sitting in my office all day but i've been anxious and scared 10 times today because i've been thinking about dogs yep. now we have about fifty thousand thoughts a day and if 10 percent of my thoughts are about being scared and anxious by a dog that's five thousand thoughts a day five thousand times a day I'm reminding myself that dogs are scary and frightening and I'm making myself scared and anxious and on edge and a bit nervy about dogs. You could see how just within the space of a week, I could take a small fear of dogs and turn it into a massive phobia of dogs if I thought about it 5,000 times a day. Hell, if I thought about it 100 times a day, even 10 times a day, you could turn a small phobia into a massive thing. So mm. metaphobes always have a, a strong, obsessive, brooding side to their nature, partly because they've copied some of that thinking style off one of their parents. Almost always one of the parents is obsessive as well. But also because it goes hand in hand with having a horrible phobia. If you, if you didn't have any unhelpful thinking styles at all and you were burgled tonight, and it was really, really scary and frightening, and you felt awful. And they threatened to come back in the next week and do it again. Be understandable why you'd be brooding all day about being burgled. If you said to me, mm. Rob, I can't get it off my mind. Every noise, I think, you know, all day long, I'm thinking, how can I lock the doors better? You know, should I get a dog? Should I move? Should I get a gun? You know, do I tell the police? Do I find a bodyguard? Should I, should I keep a knife under my bed? You know, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? Be absolutely understandable that you'd be thinking and brooding all day long and worrying all day long about if these burglars come back. It was so frightening that you're going to brood and you're going to be obsessed about it, obsessed with it 
because it's frightening. Mm. You're obsessed with it because it's frightening. So even if an emetophobe wasn't obsessive beforehand, which is unlikely because you've got to be obsessive to make it so big, but let's say they weren't, they would be within a few weeks of having it. Because it's like having a... Um, well, it's like it's like being having a death sentence hanging over you. Yeah, it's it's like it's like waiting. You know, imagine that you're waiting for the the results of your cancer test. You've had a growth on your arm for for six months, and the doctors weren't very happy about it. And you and you're sitting at home now, waiting for that call from your doctor. Are you going to be sitting happily at home, getting mm, on with your life, yeah. minding your own business, or is it going to be plaguing your mind? All day, every day. Are you going to be thinking, God, I'm 25. What if it's terminal cancer? What if I die? And you've got all these horrible thoughts going through your mind. I mean, it's horrible subjects. And I apologise. I'm sure you'll sleep like a baby tonight, right? But it'd be absolutely understandable that if you have that level of anxiety, with it would come obsessive thinking. Okay? Yep. Mm. The other side of the coin is also true, that you've got to have obsessive thinking in order to create a metaphobia in the first place that that's why a metaphobia is such a massive unpleasant phobia um mainly because all the sufferers are already obsessive so if i had a fear of flying i might think about it twice a year if i had a fear of spiders it might come into my mind once a week okay if i was obsessed about spiders it'd be on my mind a hundred thousand times a day and of course, every mm. time you think about the thing that you fear, you're creating more anxiety. And that's one of the problems. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the problems that emetophobes have, as you know, when they say sometimes, I don't know whether I'm feeling nauseous because I'm going to be ill or because I'm worrying about being ill the whole time. You know, mm. it's almost always because they're worrying about being ill the whole time. Mm. And it would make mm. anyone feel ill, wouldn't it? If, you, if you're worrying yeah. about something all day long, it feels more real. It feels more valid more likely to happen yeah yeah in the, terms that, of... that 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 right there is the probably the biggest question okay because it's such a problem point is is the nausea you yeah. know how to how to stop doing that which of course ultimately always comes back to the obsessional thinking as soon as you get past that initial hurdle of well maybe i feel like i could just about tolerate it if it was going to happen you know i'd hate every second of it but you know what? i would just about cope with it and they reduce some of that obsessional thinking, you know, just a little bit more than that it was previously. They stop feeling nauseous all day, yes. every day, it, and, yeah. it, and it's no, it's no coincidence that, that happens. Yeah, you got, you got, you got to imagine that. Let's say their actual fear is X amount, right? Let, let's say their actual fear, the genuine fear, is let's say it's three out of ten. Okay, it's probably no more. There's there's no reason for it to be any more than someone that's got a big fear of dogs. Okay, in fact, mm. it should be it should be a metaphobia should be smaller than a fear with dogs, right? Because you're way more likely to see a dog than you are to be ill, right? You are to be sick. Okay, yeah. So let's yeah. say proper emetophobia, Take out the obsessive side. Just the phobia is probably only a three out of ten. It's probably on your mind 20 or 30 times a day, okay? Bothering you, but you'd cope, you'd be able to get on with your life, okay? The drive to obsess and brood about it means you think about it a thousand times a day, which makes it 10 times worse, hmm. yeah? So now, bad maths, right? So now it's 10 out of 10. My phobia is 10 out of 10. I'm thinking about it all the time. It's the worst thing in the world. But I'm only thinking about it all the time because I'm obsessive. I'm yeah. not thinking about it all the time because the fear is so bad. Mm. Yeah? The fear is bad enough to make it a 3 out of 10. Because I'm obsessive and I'm thinking about it all day long, I'm adding way, 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 way more to the fear making it a 10 out of 10. But of course, I don't know that. Mm. I think it genuinely is a 10 out of 10. Yeah, being be, stick with my terrible analogy of being burgled, right? This is going to sound ridiculous. But someone someone breaking into your house when you're not there and stealing a telly. 
okay, and you come back from holiday, you realise your teddy's been stolen, is probably nowhere near as stressful and frightening as having three masked people break into your house with knives and you know, threaten to kill you unless you give them all your jewels. Okay? Yeah. What metaphobes do, they turn the one into the other, but they don't realise they're doing it. And that's why what you just said is absolutely correct, that the moment they start to take some control over their brooding and understand that by brooding about it, by thinking about it so often, they're making it seem much bigger than it is, they learn to tolerate it a little bit and and everything changes. Yeah, so in, in the same way that, again, just looking at how much it affects people's lives just generally... For, for the most part, and a metaphor, they just want to, to be able to live a normal life, to be able to go out and do normal people things and switch off and enjoy it. So rolling with what you're talking about there, they've got this, this phobia, they've got their, their, their beliefs around the metaphobia and, and sickness in general. And they're invited out to a normal event of going out for dinner, right? Going to a restaurant for dinner with friends. And they get that invite from a friend and because they're a bit obsessional, they inst- and they've got, as you say, that high desire for control, they instantly start looking where the, the location of the restaurant is, can they make their own way there, and can they get back on their own, what food's going to be on the menu, what's the hygiene rating of the restaurant, and then they spend a the whole week in the build-up, worrying about what's going to go wrong, and if there's going to be people drinking too much, or what if I feel nauseous at dinner, or what if people judge me for not eating properly, and then because they've worked themselves up so much and they're already up here before they even enter into the restaurant in the first place because they've been obsessing and brooding over it nonstop, they go into that evening feeling a little bit on edge and spend the whole time feeling a little bit nauseous and not really eating properly and then giving themselves a hard time for not being able to switch off. And then they make an excuse and leave a bit early and they get home and they're just brooding over the whole evening and really reinforcing that their reason for obsessing and brooding was so valid and justified yes. and therefore keeping them in that that cycle of brooding and ruminating because yes. it, it and just they makes believe, sense and they, and they believe that the horrible anxiety and worry they had that evening was caused by their fear of being sick but of course it wasn't mm. 90 percent of it was caused by them brooding and overthinking their fear of being sick their fear of being sick that big it's a three out of ten Okay. By overthinking it, they made it so much bigger, and yet they don't see that. They think that it's because they think it's happening to them. They think their fear created all that emotion, all that stress, and all those feelings of vulnerability that evening. But that's not true. 90% of that was caused by them overthinking it. And, of course, if you're thinking about it, you keep revisiting it. You keep re-traumatizing mm. yourself all the time. Being bitten mm. by a dog and leaving a dog leaving a scar on your leg and being terrified two weeks ago is bad enough. Yeah. But recreating that 20 times a day and reliving that trauma and that stress 20 times a day, that's horrible. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's like 20 dogs attacking you every day. Of course you're frightened yeah. of dogs. Of course you're going to not leave the house. Mm. Yeah? yeah OC, no, I've, OCD, I've, 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 OCD is on, bigger... OK, in as much as the OCD itself has got to the point where it's it's all consuming, it's all consuming. Mm-hmm. So they've gone past a point where they can still lead a, a, a fairly normal life with their symptom and their desire for control has got so strong and the feedback that they believe their desire for control is helpful and is helping them becomes so strong that all they do is brood every day. Have you seen um, the Aviator film with, um, what's his name? Help me. The Aviator uh, with Leo, uh, Leonardo it's an DiCaprio. Old film. Yeah, I know you, you, the, the, the Howard you Hughes. You love to reference old pop culture. Doesn't yeah, you? How, Howard Hughes story. So he was very, very obsessive right. and got to the point where for a few years, he just locked himself in a room. I, 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 you know, he brooded right. himself into such a corner, right, that he locked himself into the room. He 
didn't touch anything. He, he touched anything with tissue. And he he would go to the loo in the same room and he would never leave that room. He only felt safe. He'd wound himself up to the point where he only felt safe in that one space. Hmm. And of course, how you get out of that uh, is to slowly unwind yourself a little bit. So OCD, yeah, I'm, uh, as you're talking, reading it. Yeah. So OCD, in a general sense, is is exactly the same as being obsessive about um, a, a fear of being sick, and that you are preoccupied continuously with this horrible thing that you're that you're focused on. And the difficulty is that, that you make it significantly bigger by brooding about it. But people feel driven to brood about it. They feel that there's an answer in there somewhere. Lomborski and Tatch. Uh, Lomborski and Tatch uh, uh, did a paper on it, 2004. The consequences of dysphoric rumination. It's in all the Thrive manuals, right? Mm. In the Obsessional Thinking chapter. The consequences, the, the consequences of dysphoric rumination the consequences of brooding about something that you're unhappy about or when you're unhappy okay and it basically this paper says that many people that have an issue a problem a situation feel driven to brood about it believing that it's helpful believing that it's clever believing that it's smart mm. believing that it's the intelligent helpful thing to do to sit here and brood about it they, they really f get a real positive feedback loop that I'm right to sit here and brood about this thing. It's, it's, the, it's the clever thing to do. But it goes on to say it's absolutely yeah. the worst thing to do. You are, you are just creating a sense mm. of despair, depowering yourself, uh, creating all kinds of associated issues and worries, and eventually it just making yourself feel powerless. So challenging that obsessional thinking and getting yourself to realise that it, it, not only is it not helpful, it's massively harmful. Okay, having a little bit of a desire yeah. for control is important. Yeah, we wouldn't we wouldn't function in the day. We wouldn't get up. We wouldn't make it to school or work if we didn't have a desire for control. But when we feel powerless or when we feel that we don't have good coping skills in a situation, and then we try and over control the situation to mitigate our exposure to something we don't like, we can end up brooding and ruminating quite a lot and just creating you know, way, way, way more anxiety than they ever suffered beforehand. So if someone ever asks why emetophobia is, um, why emetophobia, emetophobia is, I, I always say emetophobia is the worst phobia to have, right? And it is. Why is it so bad for the sufferers? Why is it so horrible? A, a, a big, big chunk of why it's so horrible is, is the obsessive side to their nature making it much bigger making it yeah. much yeah. worse and, and adding in the, the comorbid symptoms like nausea alongside yeah. of that obsessional thinking things and that you wouldn't and get that, so and much you're not putting as much it yeah. on, on a fear of dogs or and actually the and actually the the the, the psycho the psychology of it the psychopathology of it is very very similar if you were to put all the beliefs all the thinking styles the attitudes behaviors of of someone with OCD next to someone with emetophobia, they would look almost identical. Mm. Yeah. In fact, you could argue that someone with OCD or someone that's very obsessive is one step away from being emetophobic. All they really needed was that disgust propensity and the focus on uh, vomit to create emetophobia. Mm. Yeah. Yes, yeah, it's, it's one step away from almost identical of the of the twenty five, twenty six different components that make up emetophobia. Probably twenty three of them are shared by people with OCD, and also the other one is anorexia. Probably twenty three are shared with people with anorexia as well. Okay, because that's another, for all intents and purposes, brooding, obsessive type disorder. Right. And now if you think, if you were to Google what are the hardest symptoms to treat in therapy psychology, I'll guarantee you that OCD and anorexia are in, are in the top three Okay, of the most mm. difficult, complex symptoms to treat and 
you know, a really, really poor response rate um, in traditional health services, mental health services, okay? It's the same reason why emetophobia is very difficult to treat with with other therapies and interventions because it's it's a complex phobia um with very bright people that are you know obsessed with understandably obsessed with the thing that's terrifying them i mean we would become obsessed with it i'd become obsessed with it if, if you were if you were mm. terrified and traumatized by this thing so that's one of the reasons you know those three things are very very close they share let's say at least 90 percent maybe 95 percent of the same dna okay emetophobia is as close to anorexia or ocd as we are to monkeys in our dna very very similar so for the people that are listening to this that haven't been through the program or maybe haven't even heard of the thrive program can you give the abridged runaround of why the content of the program works so predictably and consistently for tackling obsessional thinking in general yes okay so if you think if you think then that obsessive thinking that brooding and worrying and analyzing every aspect to the nth degree of a situation or problem okay be it a fear of being sick or social anxiety most people watching this because of course social anxiety plays a massive part in emetophobia as well right but anybody that's got social anxiety knows that feeling of knowing that they got a date in the diary for Friday night, they're going to work to, they're going to a party, they're just going to see some friends. And by Tuesday, they're already worrying about it. They're already brooding about it. What time? Yeah. Am I going to go straight yeah. from work? Am I going to have a chance to go home, first of all, and just relax a little bit? Do I get changed? I don't want to go out like this. You know, what am I going to wear? Am I going to do my hair? Am I going to go here? Am I going to do that? You know, I'm going to pre-book a taxi home, or, or am I going to walk there? What am I going to do? The attempt to over-control the situation is an attempt to mitigate the feelings that they believe the situation creates within them yeah um if i if i can reduce all the things so if i if i had social anxiety and i was going to party friday and i could do anything that i wanted to 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 limit the unpleasant vulnerable frightening anxiety provoking feelings that I will suffer I would say it has to be finished by 10 o'clock no one's gonna be drinking I don't want any big bubbly people there that might come and talk to me I don't want anyone that's gonna draw attention to me um any 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 of my friends that are you know might come and pick on me or take the mickey out of me or anything like that um I might avoid uh, going there with people that I felt were, were superior to me or more intelligent than me or had more money than me or were more handsome than me or, you know, it, eventually, you know, you end up not going out at all. Because if, if you try and mitigate the risk of exposure to something that you're frightened of to the nth degree, you end up just not leaving the house. Mm. You, you, you come to believe the only safe thing for me to do is stay at home. So in, ter in terms of social anxiety, you can see how someone could brood about that. You think about it. So brooding then, obsessing, is a symptom of our desire for control. Our desire for control, I say ours, I mean the metaphobes, desire for control is only stronger than average because there is this terrifying thing in our life that we're terrified of being sick seeing others being sick right people that don't have a metaphobia don't have that terror okay we have that terror it's utterly terrifying utterly terrifying and i feel totally out of control i don't believe i'd cope it's the worst feeling in the world i'd rather die than have it so i have a really strong will a really strong desire to control 
where I go and who I see and the things that I do in order to minimize my potential exposure to that. It makes perfect sense, perfect sense, right? To minimize my exposure to it. So my desire for control is worrying, thinking, analyzing, staying awake at night, you know, brooding about things. Uh, what can I do? I can be careful what I eat. I can check the cell by dates. I can wash my hands. All of these things are a symptom of my desire for control. The desire for control comes from, is driven by my belief that I won't be able to cope. Okay. And my belief that I won't be able to cope comes from my lack of coping skills and my lack of belief in my coping skills and, and my, my, my thinking that this thing is happening to me when in fact it's something I'm creating myself with my beliefs and my thinking styles, my attitudes, my behaviours. So the reason why the Thrive Programme is so successful uh, and, and it's the only successful thing in treating emetophobia is because it works on all of those things. Mm. Okay, we work on all of the all of the different components. I said a minute ago, there's 25 or 26 different components to it. We work on all 26 of those components. Okay, we're not skipping anything. Okay, there's no exposure, it's not necessary. Mostly doesn't work anyway. Um, there's no exposure. But if there's 26 different parts to what's creating and driving your emetophobia, our program highlights all of those 26 parts for you, makes them really, really clear, and shows you how to get over them, shows you how to change them. And nothing mm. else does that. It's as simple as that. That's why it's so successful and so predictable. Because if you do that, you cannot fail to overcome it because it's those things that are causing it. Mm. And it's, not, it's not happening to you. You weren't born with it. You are creating that unknowingly. You are creating it by, by the way in which you're thinking about it and the series of beliefs, thoughts, attitudes, behaviours that you have and disgust, propensity and social anxiety and self-esteem issues and, and then brooding about it all day long, creating all this anxiety, stirring this massive anxiety pot all day long. We take that apart bit by bit, every single aspect of it, take it apart bit by bit and slowly and carefully calm it all down and reduce it all to zero. That's why that works. Cool. Lovely. It's a good answer, wasn't it? Covered it all. Yeah, I yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. But that is Hopefully. exactly what you do. That's exactly what it does. Yeah. And you only see a very strong desire for control in someone that has poor coping skills, or the belief they have poor coping skills. Because you wouldn't need, you know, if you were, if you were confident, your self-esteem was high, okay, and you were going to a party on Friday... And you felt good, and you felt, and you felt confident, and you had good self-efficacy. You wouldn't worry who's going to be there, or you wouldn't worry that you're going to wear a tie when no one else is wearing a tie. You wouldn't worry that you're going to go with a bottle. Everyone else is bringing food. You'd, you'd go, oh, I'm an idiot. I didn't realise. Okay, wouldn't bother you at all. You wouldn't think about it. You wouldn't worry about it because you have a skill set in coping with those sorts of situations. If you haven't got that skill set and you've built it up in something really, really big you're going to brood and worry and obsess about it. And in doing so, make it 10 times bigger than it was. Yeah, I, I, I think a, a lot of people can misunderstand or make assumptions that those people that do go along, you know, and if they're wearing completely the wrong outfit or they've forgotten X, Y, Z and are just taking it all in their stride, the example that you like to give that is relating to all pop culture the fonds right yeah yeah a um you're t you is... mate, you don't listen but... don't don't you can't even talk about the fonds right because you're way too young way... yeah we're way before my time but i have googled it just because you okay. do like to mention it a lot so right. I've watched a few clips. i'm clued up i'm clued up okay um but in the same way that people do like to assume that that is genetics or you, you're just yeah. born to be super chill and relaxed and just take everything in your stride and not worry about it and not stress about it, which couldn't be further from the truth. And because that couldn't be further from the truth, by understanding exactly what you need to do to build up those skills, you can absolutely. Can you ride a bike? That person. 
can, can you ride, ride a bike, bike fortunately say again yeah you can ride a bike yeah okay? yeah, yeah i can bike. yeah and you right. can you can um you can uh swim i can swim I can. you can yeah. swim and you can um put an ikea table together possibly not oh. That might be pushing it, but I feel like I could probably learn how to do that. Yeah. Okay. And and you can do all of these. You can do you know, thousands of different things, right? How is it you can do those thousands mm. of different things? Mm. Mm. How yeah, is it? By uh, trial and error, falling off my bike a few times, getting myself back on it, and carrying on riding, and eventually you've learned, right? becomes it's second nature. Yeah, you've yeah. learned. It's a skill set. Okay, it's a skill set. That's all. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, mm, uh, mm. as is as is everything particularly in mental health right you're not born with any of it okay there's a possibility mm. on some level you're born with a with a predisposition to doing things in a certain way but you know all, mm. all the research shows particularly around things like social anxiety and brooding ruminating uh, uh, paranoia this kind of stuff this skill set that, that that someone has to thrive is is a is a skill set with 26 25 26 different components in this skill set partly about your beliefs partly about the way you think and your thinking styles partly about your attitude partly about how confident you are and about your self-esteem and about your level of social confidence and discuss propensity and whether you're a bit paranoid or not whether you tend to think in a black and white way all of these different things contribute to how powerful you feel okay and how powerful you feel in any situation at all dictates your response to that situation, right? If I feel mm. sitting here now powerful, if I think in a powerful way, a confident way about going to a party on Friday, someone that I've never met before, if I feel skillful and competent, I'm not going to worry about it. If I don't, I am going to worry about it. And the more yep. I don't, and the more I worry that I don't, the more I'm going to brood and worry and have sleepless nights. But that's as simple as that. Any situation in life you can think of, whether it's public speaking, asking someone out on a date, going for a job interview, going to the toilet, just growing up full stop, right? Even, even as a baby, learning to crawl and learning to walk. The more competent you feel about it, the less stress and anxiety you're going to create. We only create stress and anxiety in a situation where we don't feel powerful. And remember, powerful means either believing we've got good coping skills or we've got good control skills. Control skills mm. are about being able to avoid something or being able to control the situation. Coping skills are just as they sound. Could I cope? It would be awful um, you know, I felt a bit of a sore tummy today, to be honest, right? And it'd be awful if I had diarrhoea at this party tonight. Okay, it'd be oh, embarrassing, right? But you know what? I'd cope. Not the end of the world, is it? I'm still going to go to the party. Okay, it'd be embarrassing. Mm. It would be this. It'd be that. I might feel vulnerable. People might take the Mickey out of me. Okay, but do you know what? However unpleasant it would be, I'd I'd cope. You know, I'd live. Okay, so I'm still going to go to the party. If I don't believe I'd cope, you have to avoid. If you don't believe you'd cope and you believe the situation would be terrifying or absolutely awful or disgusting or just horrible, you have no option, Joe, but to avoid it. Yep. Yeah, And that's the essence of any phobia. I believe it'd be terrifying if I went in that cupboard with that spider. It would give me a heart attack, Joe. I'd rather die. If I believe that, whether that's true or not, if I believe it, I've no option but to avoid going in that cupboard. I just got to avoid it. Mm. Yeah, and that's the nature of any phobia. Yep. But the more powerful you feel, how powerful you feel dictates to you whether you're going to create anxiety or stress in a situation. And all of those components that create how powerful you feel are components are, are cognitive and behavioural and emotional components that you learnt or didn't learn whilst growing up. They were things that you picked up on, like your accent we've talked about before. You copied that off your parents, right? If you're born in Glasgow, you sound totally different, okay? You copy these things off your parents and your family and the people that you grew up with. 
most people have averagely good mental health because they picked up an average amount of those skills you needed to create good mental health. Okay, that's it. Mm, Those people that have great mental health and are thriving were very, very fortunate enough to have grown up around people that taught them those skills. That's it. Cool. Fab. That's a good end, isn't it? Covered everything there. Yeah, nice. Right. Uh, Well, I hope that if you're listening to this or you saw the title because it said OCD or obsessional thinking, it's been helpful and relevant to you. Um, And thank you very much for your time, Rob. Very welcome, Matt. See you again soon. (laughs) 